Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Your Finance TV with a special treat for you this week. Brendan McCarty actually has a window in his schedule to have some time with us and be on video for you. Welcome back, Brendan. Hey, thanks for having me, and I'm ready to go. All right. We're going to look into 2024 and your thoughts on that, and, of course, the three L picks, which everyone loves. All right. Brendan, for 2024, what are your thoughts on the possibility of the Fed cutting rates? Some analysts are suggesting six rate cuts, but I really find that hard to believe. What do you think the Fed might do in 2024? So I share your belief. I don't, I have very hard to believe that the six rate cuts, it's a lot of hope and prayer. But you only get six rate cuts when the markets are cascading, uh, the economy's diving, employment's rising, unemployment's rising. Uh, that's just silly to me. But uh, and the re there's several reasons. But first, I think the Fed by that what they'll end up what they're doing right now is and which has levitated the markets is keep the liquidity spigot open. That's driven things higher. You've seen the Nasdaq go to the moon, though it hasn't made a new high yet. I noticed, I believe. Um, S and P has climbed. The fabulous what do they call them the Great Seven, the AI Seven, a Magnificent Seven, or whatever they got all these stupid monikers these days. Um, it's kept everything moving at a rising pace. So if you keep liquidity rising and you raise assets, all of a sudden you have consumers using those assets to buy things. Well, if they're going to use assets to buy things, guess what? That's an upward pressure on a plus 3% inflation rate already. And I remember uh, every year, I remember it's funny, the Bank of England, the head of the Bank of England always has to go to the parliament at the UK and apologize for any inflation over 3%. I think that's what he has to do. Uh, the Fed should be apologizing to the U.S. public for this plus seven percent we had earlier. But aside from that, um, what we we are, I can see why the market does see inflation cooling. The CRB has leveled off. Uh, gold popped a couple of times, popped a little bit earlier this month, and then it's fallen backwards pretty hard. Uh, inflation pressures rolled as you see bonds come in. Tips is moving back towards two percent. I think it's like two seventeen, two eighteen from two thirty five. Um, so you're seeing like maybe one rate cut maybe come off the board, if, if that. If you look at the SOFA rate, the SOFA curve, nothing is moving. Uh, if the Fed was cutting rates in six months from now, SOFA would be sinking because uh, it would adjust. In my, I, I, it gets ahead of the curve. I know it's an average, but overall, I don't think they're going to cut uh, by many next year. I think the market won't like that too much. It reminds me very much of 2000. The market thought they would cut sooner after the Nasdaq imploded. In March of 2000, uh, they were like, oh, the Fed's going to get easier policy. And they really didn't until October. And that's when the bear market started. Not to say we're going into a bear market next year. Who can tell you that? But we're seeing liquidity rise in many facets. We're seeing the stocks rise, NASDAQ rise. Housing has quietly woken up. Uh, if you see uh, purchase apps has jumped. Um, I, the Fed has to learn that when they put money in the system, they have to pull it out quickly because it multiplies, especially when it's sitting at when you have overnight rates at five percent. So anybody who has a large bank account is earning five percent on that. That's five percent money more money they had a year ago. That's five percent money they can spend on something. That's five percent more demand, and that's the conundrum they're in. And I think that's why they can't cut. Maybe they get one if things start to implode, uh, but until then, I'm on the side. I I don't believe we're going to get that far. I think we're a one or one and done, if anything. Okay. Yeah. All right. We are well, we are close to the end of 2023, about two and a half weeks of trading left in it. Um, it has been an incredible performance of the NASDAQ. What can investors expect in 2024? And Brendan, what are your predictions for the market and any potential surprises we could see next year? So uh as uh one of the things, momentum is the name of the game, as our three L's have shown over and over and over again this year. Um, I think we bested the NASDAQ though so far, so I'll take credit for that. Um, but the NASDAQ is being driven. I mean, Morgan Stanley came out with an interesting piece uh, this morning. Uh, it's the same bearish story they've been sharing for over and over and over again. But uh, narrowness, one of the things I noticed in the charts last night is a lot of narrowness in the charts. Uh, the equal weights are lagging, the large caps, the, the, the regular weights or market cap weights, um, and several other things. So long story short, my view next year is we'll probably see a, a similar play from 99 to 2000. I think that's what we're seeing. We see we saw the internet revolution drive stocks 99 to 2000. It lasted maybe just 95 to 2000. So maybe we're, it, I'm not entirely sure where, but I think next year you'll see a surge further into next year. They'll try to go to the all-time highs like they did before. 
Um, the NASDAQ sits at the all-time high, so it could be an indication of where things go. And so goes the NASDAQ, so goes the markets, so to speak. Um, earnings are not a key driver. I look at it this way. When the market is strong, it was a strong market led by narrow leadership or wide, narrow, uh, wide leadership. It's usually driven by a wide leadership. Is the market stronger when the foundation economy is growing or when it's lagging? So a small caps improving or getting worse? Well, if you look at small businesses' latest reports, things are still not that great. Is it strong when is the stock market strong when earnings are not the key driver, but rather liquidity is driving it? No, the earnings need to be a, a, a base under this. You can have liquidity amplify earnings, but you can't just have liquidity drive things. You can. We're all on expectations, and then AI is a powerful is powerful, no doubt. I mean, it's got amazing things to do. Um, I use it. For different things myself in terms of just asking random questions uh so it when i'm sitting here talking to myself i talk to a machine <laughs> um it helps me in that regard so i think next year what you'll see is a surge into the beginning of the year as people try to chase thinking this was over uh we've paused over the last two weeks i think if i'm not mistaken we're only about 200 points from the s&p all-time highs or not even that right we're like 170 points um roughly so like you're seeing in other assets where Bitcoin skyrockets, you're seeing, uh, you saw gold skyrocket, assets that were delayed. And I think what we're seeing now is maybe a surge in next year with the same big seven stocks. We correct into mid year and then we'll see what the fall brings. That's it. Ultimately, it comes down to the Fed. If they just pull back on liquidity, the whole outlook changes dramatically, but I don't think they will. All right. Well, let's move on to AI and AI related stocks. And They've experienced significant growth in 2023. Companies like NVIDIA up 176%, Microsoft 50%, C3AI nearly 120%, Google 45%, CrowdStrike over 100% as well. They're very impressive gains. It seems like every company with AI is promoting it heavily. Brennan, do you think these AI stocks can sustain this momentum in 2024 or could we potentially see a pullback? So... As I was, uh, we were doing our calls in the summer. One of the, I did an interesting study on Nvidia, and Nvidia being you know big into AI. Uh, one of the things I noticed in the calls was the excitement that the if you I was rating the calls like one, two, or three by how crazy you know how excited they were, how bullish they were, and I was using ChatGPT ironically for this to identify how bullish they were on ChatGPT, which was I was asking the question to. Kind of a weird circle, right? Um, what I identify, I haven't run this on NVIDIA lately, but this this background that you mentioned where everybody's talking about AI again was very similar to the fall of last year where NVIDIA was talking up, talking up, talking up the beginning of things. It was, it was uh, I think we were still in some sort of crypto thing at that point. I can't remember now, but NVIDIA was bullish. And then the next two calls got really bullish because AI popped up. And then all of a sudden, it sunk. Oh, man, actually, you know, I might have to go back in time here. This is 21 into 22. So we were talking crypto, and then crypto sunk, and AI filled the gap last year. So we're 21 into 22. There was a lot of pumping of crypto. We're crypto. We're blockchain. We're all blah, 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 blah. And the, the and bullishness got so crazy in these calls because they wanted to get that out there that it was, it was driving stocks. Well, I think it, that rally didn't end until the following spring. Um, that's when the Fed raised rates. The Fed put a wrinkle in the whole thing. But the stock markets moved higher in the beginning, then shot higher into March. That's sort of what I think AI is going to run through. You're going to run AI is going to run in the next year. People are going to promote it heavily, and then they're going to ask, where's the profitability? Um, I couldn't tell you right now, like NVIDIA has shown plenty of profitability based on the, the need for the servers and stuff around AI. But AI itself, there's a thousand apps out there. It reminds me of all the internet websites. Everybody had a website. Well, everybody's got an AI app now. Uh, there's hundreds and thousands of them. It's crazy. Uh, and a lot of them are just human. I mean, the thing with AI, all it is is a copy of a human mind that learns. So it, based on the human being behind the app, I mean, I guess it's not bad. But aside from that, I think we're going to see these stocks run into 2024 and then we're going to run in that moment where everybody, too many people are talking about it. And they're going to ask, well, where's the support for the rally? And I think that will come in the first quarter, maybe into the second quarter. Um, again, liquidity is pushed this story crazy. 
So that could change the story. But I think this is a one or two more quarters that they keep going. Uh, it's funny how you mentioned Google. I mean, I know that that there's a push. Uh, they, the latest thing on their chat, the chat, what, Gemini, I think it's called. The latest on their thing is it's going to hurt ChatGPT big time with ChatGPT going through all the problems they're running through. So it should that might be a wrinkle. I may, may further it more or like Google does with everything. They create everything free and just destroy the competition in the process. So I don't know if that's going to be something too. So we'll see. All right. Well, you mentioned blockchain in there. So let's discuss some Bitcoin. It's risen approximately 160%, depending on when you watch this. Um, driven by hopes of a Bitcoin ETF and the approval for it. Brennan, there are conflicting opinions on Bitcoin with some like Jamie Dimon wanting it to disappear completely. Do you think the naysayers could prevail in 2024? What are your thoughts on Bitcoin's prospects for next year? So as I was asking you before, what's the new st stuff in crypto? There isn't anything new. It's the same old story. It's the same people complaining about it, Jamie Dimon. There's the same bulls involved, minus the guys that went to jail. Uh, there's the uh, SEC saying that they should make things securities versus not securities. Uh, it literally nothing has changed since I last really focused on crypto back in October. It's amazing. Um, but with that said, back in one of my uh, calls in October was the chart of Bitcoin. Um, I was looking at it was one it was Vestopedia Vestopedia somebody yep. called uh, CM Market Technicians Association or the CMT Association does the the pieces for it. So my first note was on Bitcoin, and I'm like, well, it looks like it's entering the thirty thousand to sixty thousand range. I'm looking at this chart right uh and back then at thirty thousand, it was substantially below the trend of liquidity it tends to track liquidity pretty well it also used to track tesla i forgot to put tesla up on this chart to see what tesla's doing these days but i think elon musk and evs are having their own trouble uh so we'll just move on from them but right now bitcoin has risen in a straight shot and it's it's at it's intersected with our liquid with my liquidity model uh last time it did that was in, it was two times before the first time was in late 21 and early 21 both those seem to be peaks now i'm not saying that bitcoin's going to peak here i couldn't tell you what it's going to do tomorrow never mind what it's going to do necessarily next year but i can tell you the momentum is still higher it's in a range that goes to about sixty thousand, but it did just cross with liquidity which argues that the four thousand dollar drop we saw this start this week uh maybe some sort of you know beginning of a correction of sorts within this thirty to $60,000 band, uh, Bitcoin band. Um, so I would just say this, that uh, Bitcoin and the sector itself uh, are uh, they're benefiting from the environment. They're not benefiting from really a new story. Uh, crypt blockchain is a very important technology, but there's just so much hatred towards it. It's sort of like AI. Like AI came onto the scene and all the politicians are are scared to death of it because AI, you're going to use AI and you're going to find every negative comment a politician ever made. <laughs> you're just going to search for it and there it is. Uh, it's going to identify things in such a split second. Well, crypto and blockchain was supposed to do that. They never really did. I mean, they're, and I, I, I like the fact that some people call it, it's a new asset, investable asset category. How many how long have we been talking about an ETF for this? Like we hit 66,000, we had an ETF or we didn't, or and then it fell to 18. So long story short, Bitcoin will go as far as the herd wants it to take. Um, I have this range, 30 to 60 is what I've been looking at. Um, if liquidity continues the way it is, it sh that should put pressure on the U.S. dollar, which has taken a dive. I think it's down about 4 to 5% from its highs. Um, if the U.S. dollar were to continue to fall, and it hasn't, I think it stalled at 102, uh, the dollar index. That argues that Bitcoin's move may be limited in the short term, but the longer term chart still looks okay to keep going higher. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Whatever the Fed does with liquidity here could very have a very big bearing on which way Bitcoin goes from here in the short term. Um, charts are charts, though, in this world. Everybody looks at them. Everybody thinks momentum is king. And right now the momentum surges to the upside until the last 24 hours. So <laughs> um, I would just argue that maybe a little correction could be in store, but the overall range is 30 to 60, and we're pointing higher within that range. Okay. Well, I'm sure all the Bitcoin bulls out there are hoping you're right. All right. Now we're going to wrap up today's show with the three old picks. Haven't had them done in person for a while, but 
It's been you've had a pretty good run this year. I think you're outperforming the S and P. So let's kick it off with Oracle, and they report Monday after the close. Yeah, I think we actually bested the Nasdaq by Nasdaq 100 by a little bit too, okay. um, if I'm not mistaken. I guess a 13 percent week, 11, 12, 13 percent week will help that. Um, catching playing catch up, right? Momentum is momentum is king in this market. So Oracle. Uh, this, uh, like it held the 20 week thus far. A lot of these stocks seem to have a theme in this selection of stocks this week is they all seem to have backed off a little bit from like they've backed off over the last three weeks, but this one bounced off a 20 week. Uh, if it breaks through the 20 week to the downside, so it changes my view, but for now I think it's going higher. So, uh, I like it. Uh, the next one I'm looking for is Adobe never Wednesday after the close. You know, it's interesting with Adobe. They, if um, I read a little thing to see how, like, how they treat um, delayed payments to pay for their service, and instead of shutting you off, they just delay it. And it made me wonder if they're having revenue slowdown. I don't know. Anyway, that probably doesn't matter. The chart, I like the chart. It hit the upper band a few weeks ago, which could explain why it's backing off based on what I think. Uh, but the uptrend's still in place, so I like it. Okay. Uh, Jabil, JBL, they report Thursday pre-market. Same chart as Adobe and somewhat like Oracle hit the upper band a few weeks ago. Uh, it's consolidated a bit, but I still like it. One of my favorite stores, Costco, they're Thursday after the close. Yeah, I got to get there for some uh, redo on a reload of our meats. Um, Costco looks like it's in the next major move. So Costco has these long-term moves that it tends to make, barring Barring a bad earnings report, I think it's a it's it's next move is underway, uh, like longer term move that goes through a year sometimes, uh, but it's in breakout mode, so I like it. Uh, Lenar, L E N, if there's that after close as well. So this one somewhat blows my mind. I don't understand like housing. So I mentioned housing, the purchase applications part of the MBA index had started climbing over the last six weeks, which ties to the surge in liquidity and the drop in rates. Uh, Lennar uh, has smashed through all-time highs, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's in breakout mode above 133. I wonder if it's feeding off of the purchase applications index, which is still pretty dreadful. Like, usually it's like 175. It's only 140. So I think the bulls see that. They see something turning up. They see the short supply. So I, the chart says like it, so I like it. Okay. Uh, and then we last one we have is Darden Restaurants, uh, DRI. They are Friday pre market. So, uh, DRI, it's holiday season. You know, in between shopping stops, you go to Chili's. Is that what they own? Mm -hmm. I think they own Chili's. Okay. I don't know what they own. Red Lobster, one of them. Capital uh, Grill. What is it? I think they own Capital Grill, don't they? Cap oh, well, Capital Grill. Hey, business Christmas meetings. Uh, so, this is a tough one always for me. Uh, the chart never seems to work out right for it, but I like it. Uh, I took a break last week. Uh, only a mild one. So uh, I think Christmas parties are in high gear for the Capitol Grill. Uh, and I think that the consumer is waking up. Uh, and I think the only way I say that is because the New York Fed's weekly index was 2.5% growth. So from like under one. So and with 70% consumer in this economy. So the consumer is clearly spending. So DRI would benefit. So I like it. Great. Well, Brendan, listen, hopefully we can sneak a little bit more of your time next week for the last one for 2023. Um, but just for today, thank you so much for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. It was fun as always. And for everyone else out there, good luck investing.